Hello and welcome to Fintech Impact. I'm your host, Jason Pereira. Today on the show, I have John Linker, CEO and Chief Vision Officer, and Kellen Delafont, Chief Knowledge Officer of Linker. Linker is a growth consultant that comes in and helps consult early stage startups on making sure that they have product market fit and a brand that's recognizable before the time of launch. And with that, here's my interview with the two gentlemen. John, Kevin, how are you doing? Great. Thanks for having us on the show. Thank you. Very, thank you very much for, for having us. Yes. Uh, thank you for putting up with me off of three to four hours sleep. So uh, hopefully you can carry the show today. All right. So gentlemen, tell us about Linker. Well, we help early stage businesses all the way up to well-established businesses go to the next level, whatever that level is. And, and there's a focus on growth, but understanding that growth is generally generated by getting a whole bunch of people to get behind you and say yes to your value proposition. Uh, to get a whole, whole bunch of people to get behind you and say yes to your value proposition. So uh, there's a, a huge component of just marketing uh, insights and understanding how to look at a population of people and ascertain how to get them to want to get behind you when you launch and want to support you in your growth. Excellent. All right. So let's talk about the origin of the company. How did it come to be? Well, way back in 2001, uh, we started as an interactive agency called Inviani, and we pursued that for a number of years and had a lot of really interesting successes and, and you know, opportunities to help businesses. Um, but one thing that kept coming up was that when a business would hire us to help with their you know, interactive project, that there would always be something more fundamental that they needed to think through in order to make that project successful with its branding or strategy. And so eventually we decided that we wanted to offer a full range of services around helping kind of the, the full range of needs that a business had. But we didn't want to be a marketing agency or an advertising agency. We wanted to be more like a boutique management consulting firm. We can kind of look at every aspect of the business, whether it's on the financial side, staffing, planning for growth, and, you know, your digital transformation and all the other kinds of things that we traditionally had in our in our wheelhouse. So uh, in 2013, uh, we changed the company name to Linker. And ever since, we've been helping uh, businesses from early stage startups to multi-billion, multinational corporations to, to achieve their growth goals. Okay. So let's dive into kind of the journey of what you do. So I'm an early stage startup. I have a widget. I've got a thing that I think is awesome. Basically you're pitching me on why I need, I need your services. What's the pitch? Well, we really don't pitch why people need our services. For right off the bat, we take a consultative approach. The first time we meet with a potential client, it really is kind of a mutual interview. And it, it's not so much, please hire us, pretty please, as much as it is, let us know where you're coming from, what your situation is, what your goals are. And if we see them being in a place where we could really contribute to their success, then we generally give a pitch for that and, and put some kind of proposal together. But it's, it's really all about helping organize a set of priorities and goals for the client and going through a conversation that helps everyone in the conversation understand what it is they're actually facing. And I'd say, you know, at least seven times out of 10, the entrepreneur has not fully thought through uh, the business situation and and finds all sorts of interest in helping uh, and, and, and allowing us to help them think through their situation, kind of get them on track and maximize the probability that they're going to achieve their goals. Uh, Kevin actually does quite a bit with the early stage research on this, and he probably would want to chime in on some of this. Yeah, it's Kevin, by all means. One of the interesting things about what we do is that the, the problem that the client brings to us is almost never the problem that they're actually dealing with. But there's this level of the difference between how they think of the problem and then over the course of uh, of some discovery and conversation and exploration, you find out that the problem has a different character to it. So that's one of the value proposition that we bring is that there's a, we have a process for helping clients to come to better understand what their actual challenges are and therefore what the uh, solutions that we craft are going to be tailored to a more uh, broader and more comprehensive assessment of what their actual problem situation is. So there's a bit of a like a therapy element here. Like you can imagine, you know, kids, kid who has some like behavioral issues that you know, and they come to you seeking help. 
And you're not just going to say, well, I'll just look at the surface behavior and say, I think I have an answer for you. You're going to, especially if a kid has sort of like pathological behaviors, which is sometimes happens with startups and people like they're just behaving pathologically. There's a deeper story here. There's other things going on. There are constraints going on. There's history. Un- oh, so unpack that first. Actions. What, what would you refer to as pathological behavior? Behavior that, well, is it certainly isn't in their long-term rational self-interest. Hmm. They're burning up money that they don't have. They are making decisions in the wrong order. They um, are, are prioritizing things or they're not thinking about things that they know are, is, are going to be um, important for their success just around the corner. So there's all kinds of things that uh, we might have to, we can help uh, clients to see a, a clearer path forward. Yeah, there's Actually, there's a lot of reasons why early stage technology startups, whether it's a SaaS platform or, or something, you know, some app or something, why they get off track and why they, they struggle. Um, so one area is just maybe they're coming from more of an engineering perspective and they have this really cool uh, technology that they they believe if they just create it, it's going to improve the market in some way. And and they just go about building it and getting people to to help maybe get some seed capital around it. And they haven't ever really done a full market opportunity analysis. So the first reason people fail uh, in these endeavors is lack of a proper market opportunity analysis, looking at the need in the marketplace, understanding who the audience is and who the buyer is, looking at the competitive landscape, looking at what is the current solution that's being offered and and how far along is is that current solution in terms of its development and and market adoption. And um, just really figuring that out, that there's there's actually something that if you build it, the people will come if you promote it properly. So um, going through that analysis is something that a lot of times by the time clients get to us, it's it's a little too late for that. You know, they're burned through 80%, 90% of their runway, and they haven't really uh, started doing anything towards establishing their brand or getting traction or getting advocates to to really be behind it. And so they're on their heels, they're panicking. It's it's not a great situation. One of the reasons that Kevin and I are doing these interviews is because we we want to get the the message out there to entrepreneurs and in, in fintech to think about the right things earlier, um, have the proper framework and the roadmap for success before you get so far into it that you don't really have an opportunity to recover. So for, for example, again, most entrepreneurs are focused on the technology. They put, you know, most of their resources and time behind that and they kind of procrastinate on the go-to-market strategy and gaining traction in the branding and, and all that. And so they don't even really understand the capital requirements to get to the milestones that they're promising their investors they're going to get to. They don't, they don't even know the math around that. So those are the kinds of things that we can help with in a very serious way. We've got you know really smart tools and financial models and uh, customer lifetime value simulation engines and really cool things that can guide uh, early stage decision making. So that's that's one thing that the problem is they fail because they haven't done a proper market opportunity analysis. Linker helps early stage fintech startups do smart market opportunity analysis. Yeah, it's interesting. I mean, you had so many key like issues with not just like venture caps funded companies. I mean, some of them are specific. Like when you start talking about the capital requirements to get to to get to uh, so when you start talking about the capital requirements to get to the milestones, absolutely that's a VC issue. But too often, I use this example all the time. It's the example of the 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 artist. You know, an artist gets into art because they love art, but they don't want to be starving artists. They need to learn how to sell their uh their their art and you know the old the old comparison is van gogh dying broke and penniless while as picasso was a very charismatic person who knew how to sell his wares and died the richest artist ever to live at the time and it's you know too often especially in technology people are basically dissatisfied with something and think well i can build a better mousetrap now let's say it is better right doesn't mean it's going to capture the market share away from the incumbents i mean how many different email handlers have you seen yet the default is still outlook for 99 percent of the market right so it's oftentimes I'll, I'll have this debate about like someone saying well you know that that technology doesn't do xyz 
my response was, well, what does it matter? Right? Like it, it functionally accomplishes the same thing without any kind of friction. And you're not exactly offering a 10 X multiplier on efficiency. So why go through the pain of change? Right? So it's not surprising to me that people will get obsessed with the painting or the artwork or whatever tool they're doing and stop to think that is just think that if I just build a better mousetrap, the world would be the bath of my door. There's been millions of better mousetraps patented yet. The one we always think of is the spring loaded one. Right. Yeah. Another, another area that um, ends up kind of getting in the way of success is underappreciating the importance of being a known quantity. Yes. If not in the population of people in the, the consumer market or, you know, the, the businesses that are going to actually buy from you, the, but the people, the journalists, the, the content creators, the influencers who influence those people, if you would go to a conference in your industry, and nobody would have any idea who you are. And yet you think that you're about to pioneer this revolution through your technology. You know, you're, you're underestimating the difficulty of getting anyone to care about even hearing how smart your idea is because you have not laid the groundwork by making those connections, showing up, contributing to other people's success, chiming in on their work, being appreciated as a strong member of the community, a valuable member of the community, and then subsequently being invited to do things like, well, maybe you're not going to do a keynote speech at a, at a conference, but maybe they want you to be on a panel. And, and you do such a good job, you show your relevance and, and how engaging you can be with an audience that they maybe eventually ask you to do a breakout session. And, you know, those things continue. You know, if it's going to take you three or four years to get to market, during that three or four years, you should be building strong support among the people that will lift you up and support you and, and get behind you. So if, if, if nobody knows who you are, if you're, if you're not a known quantity among the people who are in the conversation, you're, you're not going to get a warm reception. And uh, I've seen even very wealthy, powerful people uh, in one market who, who've had serious exits and made literally billions of dollars go into another market opportunity and just think, well, I've been successful over here. I don't need to do the groundwork over here and then spend seven or $8 million in a few years and completely fail because they didn't do the same kind of due diligence that they would have done, that they had done before. And, you know, sort of like throwing a football down the football field when there's no receiver there to catch it. It just, it's a completely wasted effort. Why, what do you think is going to happen? You know, you have to coordinate it and time it. And, you know, another thing that people don't really appreciate, and this is kind of a third thing, and, and you know, Kevin can kind of talk about this, but failure to really understand the importance of your branding even years before you launch. And you think, well, why would I have to worry about that when I'm not even going to market for at least a couple of years? I'll, I'll worry about that later. And the reason is, is because what is a brand? A brand is what people believe about you. That's what we say. And the minute that it doesn't matter what people you're trying to influence believe about you, that's the minute that branding doesn't matter. But because it is always important that whoever you're trying to persuade in any moment, it's important that they believe in you and, and buy into what you're offering and understand it. Branding becomes important from the beginning and you should be nurturing it right from the start as the technology is being built, as your team is being built, it'll affect how you attract people and what they believe in and, and how committed they are. It'll attract investors that believe in you and believe in your idea because you've pres they believe something about you. It's more than just the, uh, the ones and zeros. So these are, these are things that uh, we care a lot about. Kevin writes extensively about branding. We have, uh, um, I mean, I was just thinking the other day about the popularity of of startups that like to operate in stealth mode. <laughs> they use this expression. Let's, let's be honest. There, there can be some advantage of that when there's like a highly competitive space and you're very early and you're not making, but, but at a certain <laughs> point you get to a level of like, we're going to be in market in like 24 months. At a certain point, stealth mode is an excuse because you, you don't have a skill set developed to be able to do the things, or I should say, your competencies are all focused on technical issues or development issues or so on, which is fine. And you don't really know what the game plan should be to poke your head up out of the sand and shout to the world, we're here. Like, how do you do that? There's a lot of uncertainty around that. So it's 
or comfortable to stay in stealth mode longer. Well, the downside of that is that you're missing that opportunity to be intentional about starting something that will compound over time, right? John's talking about, you know, starting early. Brand influence compounds over time. And so the earlier you get started, the less work you have to do if you start earlier than if you start late, just like saving for retirement. Yep. And I, you know, it's funny, as you mentioned this, I think of companies I've seen succeed and fail in the startup space. And yeah, one I'm working very close with that, frankly, they didn't even, I think they, there was buzz about them before they were even in beta testing. And, you know, I had seen it at that point. And the, while they were going to VCs, they were starting to attend conferences and get their name out. And the first enterprise contract that they got wasn't, the product wasn't even done yet. You know, that, that was, that, that pattern has been repeated now in multiple countries where the first enterprise contracts they've landed because of what they've done in other countries is basic. It's still in dev is getting contracts in those countries, large enterprise scale enterprise contracts, quite honestly. So it's, it's amazing what you can do. It's a, it, like, it's amazing how little you can accomplish when you have a finished product and no, and no funnel and or no awareness and how much you can accomplish when people are actually slowly being sold on your vision and and you know the the, the money is literally there waiting for you just to finish up and as you said the, the investment piece as well it's um it's important and the, i said the last thing about stealth mode is where's your feedback mechanism you think you're building something the market's going to accept but do you have any idea that's right that's right and, and, and your ideas can be in stealth mode right but you shouldn't be in stealth mode the fact that you exist should be broadcast widely. And, you know, there's a guy recently who asked to have a meeting with me who was with a major, major platform company, SaaS platform company. And I've known him for maybe five or six years, real contributor in the community. Uh, he was an employee of this, of this company, always helping people, had a podcast, always doing uh, demo sessions to help people with their problems. And anyway, he recently decided to leave this company and start his own startup based on creating a marketplace for certain skills around this technology. And the basic knee jerk reaction when I heard this is, well, of course it was him. Of course he would be the one to do something like this. Everybody's going to see that. And everybody's going to root for him because of the foundation and the relationships that he laid, the demonstrated care for the space, right? Uh, a true commitment. And, and that's the kind of thing that you can't really manufacture. You know, it's like, you know, genuine authenticity. <laughs> it's like, you know, everybody talks about authenticity and transparency, clear, transparent transparency, not the opaque transparency right? The, the sort of substitute, you know, it, it's got to be real. It's got to be early. And what you want is key people positioned at, at many levels and in different kind of regions of the market who are just like, yeah, wow, this is, this totally makes sense that, that this person or these people are involved in this initiative. And I'm, I'm really excited to see what they do. And that, again, that's branding, right? You, you're, you're out there making people believe in you. And that creates a tailwind to the work that you're doing. I, I tend to try to avoid going into situations like going to a conference where I'm quote unquote, trying to network. And, you know, you're just walking up to people and trying to exchange business cards and tell me about you. Here's a little bit about me and that whole kind of mundane thing. Rather, I always try to go into a situation where I have something special to offer, right? And it could be as simple as, hey, my name is John. I'm having a cocktail party tonight at this really cool speakeasy. Here's a, a card. If you're interested in coming, show up at seven, <laughs> you know, and it's just a way to, it, it's not completely self-serving. You know, you're doing something that could be cool and enjoyable for somebody else. But, you know, maybe that leads to, wow, you know, really like this guy. I, I hear he does talks on this topic, you know, maybe next time we have this thing, you can come and speak. It really is just about putting yourself out there and, and kind of shining up, you know, the parts of you that are, that are the best and, and go in there and be an active nurturing member of the community. And don't be afraid to speak up because you're going to get a lot of validation and, and good insights into the things that you're offering. So that's, that's the second reason why why people don't really succeed is, is that they just don't 
invest enough in the relationships that are going to help them succeed, even if they have a really great idea that genuinely sees a need in the market. And so then, you know, kind of that, that's more like the personal branding to get support. And I, I think we touched on branding, but branding itself, not developing a sense of the value proposition, not doing a serious comparative analysis of the competitive field and early on getting really good at positioning yourself compared to those other businesses and uh, starting to put, you know, successive releases of information that build support over time. So that by the time you get to launch, you've developed the belief system around what you're doing to at least the same measure as the actual infrastructure of the platform. Excellent. So, I mean, you know, again, I'll let go. I've seen this done incredibly well with a couple of startups who I think, you know, even when they were still in the, when they basically proved out that the, the technical requirements, what they could do and knew they could move forward, they hired the chief revenue officer almost right away. And this guy started going out there, shaking the tree, whether it be on enterprise relationships or VCs or whatever else it was, and, and starting getting the speaking gigs going. And again, like these companies, this company got out there and had had a massive amount of demand lined up for when it was ready to go. Contrast that to countries, companies I've seen where it's like, okay, we're ready to go live and we got four months of runway. <laughs> it's like, okay, great. Do you have any contracts? No, nothing's really lined up yet. Hmm. That's, uh, that's problematic, right? So it's, uh, it's, it's troubling. So talk to me about, I guess, what are best practices around this for, for people, when you come in, what are the kind of key cornerstones that you make sure that they kind of check the boxes on? I think I've talked more than Kevin. <laughs> yeah, I'm no, trying to think about the, how to narrow down best practices with respect to branding. Uh, well, let me, let, me, let me start and then you can fill in. So the first thing is to make sure, if, if you think about kind of the engine of your business, it has got a certain number of cylinders and making sure that there is a cylinder in place for each component of the business, that there's nothing missing. So for example, do you have a business plan, right? Do you, have you thought through the road that's in front of you and, and truly demonstrated that you have a command of everything that it is you're going to be facing? And do you have an answer for all the obstacles that you're going to face? And if, as is generally the case, there are areas of serious neglect in that thinking, one of the first things you've got to do is, is go around and address those, those things, especially when you're seeking funding, right? When you're presenting, here's what I'm trying to raise. And, and if you have an extremely articulate game plan that's well-reasoned and sound that uh, demonstrates credibility, being smart about resource utilization, burn rate, being smart about priorities, that often can be just the nudge that an investor needs to go, yeah, this is, you know, these guys have a very smart plan and I can believe in it. So, you know, having that plan, really doing analysis of the existing solutions and, and looking at really what, what are the key differentiators? What is it that makes what you're doing so much better? Making sure that's really sound because you know, if you have something that's not, you, you can't patent it, or it's kind of orbiting other innovations, but they're, they're easily, re, they can be re, repeated and replaced by people who are better capitalized and more established in the market. Those are the kinds of things that you just, you have to identify early on. And if there are any weaknesses there, you know, there needs to be some real thinking around how to make a plan for a real competitive advantage. So kind of making that, that, game plan for the technology itself, bulletproof is a part of what needs to happen. Again, oftentimes entrepreneurs will surround themselves with people who are kind of, yay, Rago team, this sounds great. I want to support my friend. And they're not really getting the critical thinking that needs to go into shaping the thing. So those are those are some of the, the things that we, we do early on. Now, one of the things that we've done to attract clients in the past is, especially startups, is we'll, we'll go looking on platforms that are looking for a chief marketing officer, because uh -huh. that's actually a mistake that companies make early on. They say, it's time to get a CMO. And they go and they pay a big salary and, and give you know points in their business to attract somebody who's more or less going to do a concentrated amount of strategic thinking. And then they're going to be hiring a bunch of people to do all the rest of it. And that's not a really smart utilization of funds 
until much later down the road. One of the reasons we exist is to come in instead of hiring a CMO, we bring a team of seven or eight people to come into the situation and serve the company on multiple levels in a very kind of integrated way to make sure that for you know that same expenditure, you're getting not just the high level strategic thinking, but the, the practical Im- implementation sensibilities and, and the ability to just move things around in a, in a very significant way whilst not making a commitment to a long-term salaried position. Usually you know, within 12 to 15 weeks, we can come up with the smartest possible game plan for a client. We, we have a th- thing we call a focus engagement that you know for essentially the same salary you'd pay uh, a CMO, but for about three months. And you have the most solid game plan that several very seasoned executives were involved to help your leadership team craft to make sure you're going in the smartest possible direction. Um, so that's, that's why we, we exist is to make sure that things get set straight. Yeah. So at the end of the day, you're doing all that work, but then at the same time, you're turning it back to someone internal to, to execute, correct? Or how much are you aiding that execution? Well, because we're unlike a marketing firm, a traditional marketing firm or an advertising agency or something like that, we're completely committed to the outcome. We're, we're there to help the client achieve their overarching business goals and to reach their milestones. So as we're kind of crafting this plan, it's in complete light of their actual financial reality. So the recommendations we're making are about maximizing the efficiency and the effectiveness of every, everything that's done, not just marketing, but also staffing, raising money, when and how to raise money. We've been involved in a lot of tens of millions of dollars of, of funds raised for clients in terms of helping influence the yes that they're after. So, you know, we, we help kind of think through all of that. And um, once that plan is done, generally there's some kind of role for us going forward, but it's, it's not like a normal agency would have. We, we don't see ourselves as the solution to everything, you know, spend all your money with us. No, generally speaking, there's, there's going to be a complement of several players and some of them third party some of them we help kind of shape their staff and and help them hire people but really it's about getting the the smartest possible players into the positions to maximize the probability of reaching the milestone and and to have the marketing spend be as efficient as possible and so we you know we're even hard on ourselves we know what a company can afford to spend on the kind of strategic thinking that we bring and beyond which is, is just not healthy for them. It's not healthy for us. So generally we're involved in some capacity. Um, we do a lot of branding, helping bring those brands to life. Uh, we do a lot with digital transformation and helping build marketing and sales pipelines and all the kind of uh, technology involved in that, getting it set up right, making that, bringing the cost of that way down. The reason we can do that is because most of the expertise around marketing technology, uh, sales and marketing technology stacks, most of the real expertise is tied up within the companies that sell those platforms. And so they tend to be super expensive, whereas we're agnostic. We're just, we understand how to design those systems. And we're just looking at, at it being the right size for the business at the stage of development that they're at. And oftentimes, the kinds of solutions that we can help construct are, you know, the, the cost of ownership is super low in the end, you know, the ability for the client to make changes and, and do things that are, that are super cost effective is really high. So, you know, we, we try to guide our clients to the smartest possible utilization of their resources. And yeah, we, we generally have some kind of role, you know, but the goal is as long as, as they're moving forward, they're achieving their goals, all the numbers are lining up, they're tracking with their budget our goal is to is to be useful as long as we're useful. And at, at a point when, like the kid riding the bike, you know, they they take the training wheels off, and now they know they know what to do. You don't want to sit there and try to hold on to them now that they can ride. You know, you want to be there to encourage them, and if they fall, you're there to kind of help them heal. So you know, that's that's kind of our attitude. Is is it's really about serving the client's need. So question then becomes. Is there, when is it too early to come to you guys? And when is it too late? Like, you know, I know what you can do when you get there, but there's got to be a sweet spot of the stage that they're at before. Never it's too early, never too late. 
ever too early, never too late. Unless they're out of money, right? That, that is too late. Well, no, no, no. And really, I mean, there's, I, you know, we've, I can think of a couple situations, two in particular. One was for a platform and one was for a consumer product. And they came to us and like, really believe in you, heard good things about you. I've got this big pile of money and I want to go and make this dream thing happen. And after a very short conversation, it becomes clear that what's going to happen is they're going to take their entire nest egg and they're going to blow it and they have zero chance of success. And what we tell them at that stage is here is a, a path for you to take that will help you lay the groundwork for doing something like this in the future once you have kind of paid the price of qualifying yourself to do this. But as you stand right now, we can't advise you to go forward. We, we believe you lose all your money. So that that's happened uh, at least a couple of times. And um, sometimes I mean, there's, there's clearly times in which you can't recommend a course of action. But that's not the same as saying we, we can't offer help in helping someone diagnose their problem situation. And that, that, that at any stage, if it's really early, then maybe the problem is like they're looking for a problem solution to fit. They're looking, they have a product or a nice service and they haven't quite developed to the point where it's, it's fitting, it's serving as a solution to a market problem. So we can help them find that. Later on, there's a stage where they're looking for a product market fit, where they're trying to get traction. And it's a different set of challenges there. We can help them find that. And then later on, let's say they're much larger, they've got traction and they're looking to scale. And then they're looking for a business model that's going to fit their in their uh, market and their business and make it scalable. That's a different problem again. It's also all for I see there's all d- different types of fittedness: problem solution fit, product market fit, business model fit. These changes over time. All of those you're exploring the solution space around a problem, and you have to have a process for doing that. So one of the things that we do, we bring a process around problem solving where we open up the space of possibilities around a problem and explore that space and then, you know, test them, find the test things, and then you find things that look promising and zero in on those. And so there's an iterative process of adaptively finding solutions that are better and better fit. And that model, which is part of what we do, is quite, is a generic problem solving model actually, which is the reason why you can, it can be applied to almost in any industry and in any uh, context, because every context has problems to solve. All right, gentlemen. So before we wrap up, there's three questions I'm going to ask you both. Uh, you can volunteer as to who wants to go first on each one, but send on a positive note. The first question I have for you is, if you had one wish for something to change in your company or the industry as a whole, what would it be? Ethics. Oof. Okay. Having, having, having ethics. In fact, Kevin and I have our own podcast called the Influence Hacker Podcast. And the entire mission is to discuss issues around making marketing more ethical. And so that's, that's the first one. We believe that we've got just a terrible problem with propaganda, information pollution, all these horrible things that are, are really kind of bringing down humanity and, and kind of polluting human consciousness. But the paradox here is that we believe that marketing really is the answer, right? That's the problem, but it's going to have to be marketers who really come in and and decide to change their thinking and align with a different set of values. And this is a set of values that we teach. So it's, that's, that's probably the biggest impact would be making marketing more ethical. Excellent. Uh, Yeah. um, I've lamented across about, uh, some actors in the industry basically having less than ethical marketing. And it's one of these things where it's almost like, I'm sure they're, they're thinking of it almost like the, uh, the description of the benefit of procrastination and that hard work pays off in the future. Procrastination pays off now. On some level, I'm sure they're thinking that the unethical marketing will pay off now, but there's absolutely a penalty to be paid for disappointing people and people learning that you can't be trusted. All right. So uh, Kevin, your turn. Well, I wish, I mean, I'll just sort of extend from John's, John's point. I do wish that we operated within a system where the natural incentive structure of the economic system and the financial system tended to support our our best interests, but it does not. The natural tendency, if you don't bring your own set of values to the table, is that it makes us worse people. And because the natural incentives, the economic incentives don't care about human welfare, they have a, a logic of their own. 
it's optimizing something, but it's not optimizing human flourishing. So you need the way that you survive and in a highly capitalistic, highly economically competitive environment with the structure, at the end of the day, at the end of your career, you can look back and say, held high, is that you have to have brought an awful lot of your own personal values and integrity to the game from the very beginning and nurtured it and defended it and resisted the other forces that otherwise, if you relax, it will take you apart. And that's the reality of that. And I wish that that wasn't so, but I think it's true uh, that we have to, you have to confront, if you want to do this work ethically and achieve long, it turns out, achieve long lasting success for clients where they can build a business they can be proud of and, and is sustainable. Uh, you have to do look beyond the natural instead of structures of profit and loss. Uh, mm-hmm. There's got to be other values at play. I want to just piggyback off that because it's not just about judging others and saying, you know, you're unethical. But when in the context of clients coming to us, what we're trying to do is help them become the undeniable solution in their market and the brand their audience has come to know, trust, and love. That's our slogan. We want to help them become the undeniable solution in the market and the brand their audience has come to know, trust, and love. And, and how do you do that? How does that become more than just some slogan and a platitude? The way you do it is you do a very smart comparative analysis of what is currently being offered in the marketplace. And then you basically pursue this question. What is it that we could do with this platform that if we did it, it would make us undeniably the market leader? What is it that we could do that if we did it would make us the undeniable solution in the market? And so now what you're focused on isn't just trying to sell whatever it is you have and glossing over the deficiencies. It's about determining what is going to make your product really stand out or your platform or your service, and then doing the hard work necessary to evolve it into that. Now, you may maybe can't do it overnight, but you're, you're moving it in that direction. You've got that vision and you're leading it there. And because you're doing that, now what does marketing become? Marketing becomes a process of persuasively educating people about the truth of why you are the undeniable leader right? Just turning, you know, it's like that, that dimmer switch in the dining room. You're just gradually turning on the lights of the truth. The more they dig in, the deeper they go, the more they're illuminated about the accuracy of that reality. And so that's really what our practice is about. It's not just about telling the story of what it is a client's doing, not just about, you know, putting a wrapper and we're calling that a brand around what it is they're doing. It's about fundamentally looking at the need in the marketplace looking at the competitive landscape and crafting a solution with the client that undeniably people would say, you know, I'd have to be stupid to not say yes to this. This is clearly the right way for us to go. I'm going to say yes to that. So crafting that and then telling the story about that, that is where people go wrong. They don't go through that process. And it sounds so simple and it really is that it takes work and it takes determination and it it takes will, will to want to compete and be the market leader and not just kind of talk people into, uh, I've got, you know, one of our clients, one of our earliest clients, and I won't say who it is, but they checked all the boxes, right? They were, it's like, of course they would be the ones to do this because of their reputation and what they've done before. They did the hard work to really, and they, they truly understood the competitive field and they saw absolute deficiencies in what was being offered. And, and this goes back to 2008 when they hired us, they were pre-revenue. And fast forward to today, one of our best references, they do like $400 million in revenue a year. All well done. Excellent. All right. So the next question for you, what's been the biggest challenge in getting the company to where it is today? Well, I mean, the, it's, it's a matter of taking a dose of our own medicine, right? Yep. Because for years and years and years, I ran Lenker. I started it, I ran it, and we were limited by the fact that I was wearing all the hats and I was trying to control this vision and there are ups and downs, ups and downs, ups and downs. The day that I decided to open myself up and be vulnerable to bringing in three other partners and transfer 75% of the value of Lenker to three other people, which is what I did and bring super competent people that were going to not make it easy on me 
but sort of the rigor of going through that and, and, and having super competent people come in, that transformed us almost overnight. Many X growth as a result of that. I stepped down as CEO, brought in somebody who was a much better leader of businesses. I'm, my title now is chief vision officer, right? And, you know, bringing in somebody like Kevin, I, I've always been so fascinated with, you know, sort of the, the human factor side of, of all this. And I've written and tried and I never had the background knowledge that somebody like Kevin has. So building a team, you know, people who are really into data science and understand how to create markets, can craft consumer segments based on data. And, you know, there's all these people now who, you know, lead strategy, lead research and analysis, lead business growth. That's sort of been the, the thing that kind of broke the dam for Linker. Kevin, I don't know if you've got a, your, your version of that. You're getting out of the way. That's a great, great answer. Full of that. Getting out of the way is important. Hiring people who are different in, than you and smarter than you are trying to is always a, a good rule of thumb. Absolutely. All right. Last question I have for both of you is what excites you about what it is you're working on and keeps you getting out of bed every morning to fight the good fight? I'm going to say that one of my main preoccupations with this job is entirely philosophical. This is it, 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 it scratches an itch about deep understanding about the nature of the world, world reality. And I have, I'm very interested in things like when you see the Nike swoosh, you see that symbol and it has a certain impression in your head, your brain fires and you have an experience. Now, how did that happen? What, what's the process that led from that arbitrary artifact you were exposed to it, then all of a sudden it has this ring of resonance inside someone's brain. In fact, crowds of people at a distance and it's particular meaning. It's not just a shape. It's not just a color. It's not just a form or a word. It's a meaning. And how did it get attached? We have natural meanings in the world where smoke means fire or so forth. Uh, and you have these arbitrary meanings where arbitrary symbol gets attached to something in the world, like a meaning. That's very interesting. When branding, there is elements of craft and art involved, you know, similar to I'm trying to paint a picture. I want to have the experience of whoever's going to walk, view the picture, have an experience. How do I take what's in my head and create something in the world, pick a, a composition, whatever, such that then I can take that artifact away, show it to them, and they have an experience that's what I intended or, or something like that. It's a miraculous thing. We don't really understand how that happens, but it is there is a craft to it. With branding, you have this additional level of, of oddity to it, difference, like because what you want to do is create associations between, say, your brand or your logo or your, or your identity or something, some way, with an audience segment so that they, they get exposed to an ad or a commercial or a website. And then sometime later, they're gone. They're doing other things. They're on their bike. They're talking to someone. And a situation arises and it's a trigger for them to think about your brand. How did that happen? How did it happen so that in that moment, it came to mind? And that was something that was good that you, they should have because it was, and for example, it was a, something that, that was going to be a useful idea for them. So we're trying to engineer all that. And the craft of doing this is so intellectually interesting to me that uh, we have a canvas every day with new clients, new opportunities for to us to for me to sort of explore the different dimensions of this weird thing that human beings are capable of doing. And if it also helps people take a great idea and find a home for it, that's great. Then you're making the world a better place. But I have to say, the whole human drama involved in what we do for me is intrinsically fascinating. Gentlemen, thank you so much for your time. Greatly appreciated. And uh, to anyone who's looking for this kind of support, by all means, uh, check out Linker. So that was today's interview with John and Kevin from Linker. If you want to learn more about Linker, visit linker.com slash fintech impact. And as always, if you enjoyed this podcast, please leave a review on Apple Podcasts, SoundCloud, Stitcher, Spotify, or wherever your podcast. Until next time, take care. This podcast was brought to you by Woodgate Financial, an award-winning financial planning firm catering to high net worth individuals and their families. To learn more, go to woodgate.com. You can subscribe to this podcast on iTunes, Stitcher, and Google Play, or find more episodes at jasonperera.ca.